Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. After a brief one-day respite to focus on bashing the president's Supreme Court nominations, Democrats are back to attacking his executive order on immigration. Take a look. If he can ban Muslims, he can ban Seventh-day Adventists, he can ban Catholics, he can ban Jews. And I'm telling you right now, we got to stand for each other right here, right now. Donald Trump, your two third wives are immigrants. Your children's mothers are immigrant. Don't you have any concern about immigration to this country? Well, President Trump so far has shown no sign of backing down against their wailing and lamentations. Today, the president tweeted this. Everybody is arguing about whether or not it's a ban. Call it what you want. It's about keeping bad people with bad intentions out of the country. Well, Michelle Bronet is the director of Migrant Rights and the Justice Program at the Women's Refugee Commission. She's called on people to resist President Trump's executive orders and says that sanctuary cities make this country safer. Michelle Bronet joins us now. Michelle, thanks a lot for coming on. You're very Let welcome. me just say at the outset that I think that your motivations seem totally pure. I've read a lot about you. I think you're trying to do good work for people in need, and so Thank I respect you. that. Um, but I'm looking also at the polling on mm -hmm. refugee resettlement, and the public cannot be described as supporting it now or in the past. We're strikingly low support for resettling refugees in this country. And if you ask people, do you want them resettled where you live, in your neighborhood, it's even lower. And I'm wondering why that is. Why do you think people don't support it? I, well, first of all, I'm not sure that people don't support it, right? I think some polls show that they don't, and I know that uh, support for the programs varies, right? It varies over time, and it varies geographically and among different groups of but people. But I think it's fair to say there's not overwhelming support for it. I mean, Correct. I could point it, to some numbers here, pretty low. Yes, in some cases they are low, and, but I think overall, um, at least the Americans that I in, engage with, and maybe I'm, you know, I try to be diverse in my, in my uh, encounters with people, but I think people do support it. I do think that People are uh, concerned sometimes, right, about um, about how it's going to affect the country. But I think if you look at pockets where that where there is resettlement, yes, there is support. Um, and in fact, many communities that have resettled refugees ask for more refugees. Huh. That's actually more common than communities who experience having refugees in their community saying we don't want them, right? I guess what I find interesting, though, in this debate, there's almost no conversation uh, that I have heard about the effect of refugee resettlement on Americans. There's the mm -hmm. obvious point that's often made that if you're fleeing some war-riven country or a poor right. country, of course, it's a massive upgrade to come to America. Right. But what about the Americans? So you, you tweeted out recently, you said, asylum seekers at our border are fleeing violence, which is obviously mm -hmm. true. Central America, among the most dangerous regions in the world, that's all completely true. Right. So a lot of Central Americans have been resettled here, Salvadorans, mm -hmm. Hondurans, et cetera. We've also seen a cost to that, though. MS-13 didn't exist before large numbers of mm -hmm. Central Americans came here. Not attacking all of them, but that's a real thing that's affected Americans. Do you recognize that as a cost? I, I First of all, I would note that MS-13 didn't exist before the U.S. started imprisoning and returning Central Americans to Central America, right? So we could, I mean, and I don't want to get into the root causes of it, but well, it actually, the, the, the gang started in the United States, in Los Angeles, and were right. actually deported to Central America. So, you know, I don't know that... I'm not sure they, I'm following your logic Well, I mean, here. the point is just that they didn't necessarily were they unfairly start imprisoned? in Central America. I don't, I'm not an expert on that issue. But, but, I just wanted to point out that they didn't start there. But to your point, to oh, your point, let me just get to your But there are still refugees who are here... And their presence has created a massive crime problem called MS-13. That's a cost, isn't it? Well, again, first of all, I think uh, we need to distinguish between refugees and people who come here on, on, in other ways, right? I mean, I just want to make sure that the audience understands that, that we have a formal refugee resettlement program. Not all immigrants are refugees, which of is course. What has been, um, uh, which is what one of the executive orders addresses directly is refugees, right? Right. Central Americans coming, for the most part... Um, are not refugees. There is a small, small, small refugee program now that just started and is likely to to, to not continue. It's it's okay. on halt now, right? But um, they come in as asylum seekers, which is different. Um, but it's a technical thing. We don't need to, to worry about it. But yes. But there's no I, doubt that refugees from Central America have wound up in criminal gangs. Of course. That, there, okay, there's so criminals in all communities, right? I would argue, though, to your point of what, well, what immigrants be, and refugees okay. have done for this country and the effect on it, I think overwhelmingly it's a positive effect, not a negative effect. Okay, but I, don't you think that you weaken your case by downplaying or refusing to acknowledge the downside of it? There's always downsides. I, I'm going to acknowledge but when that you there say, are, I guess here's how I'm... Who's coming in, right? And you want to treat them like anybody else. If they commit crimes, they should 
be but, held but will you acknowledge something that I think common sense confirms, and I also think social science proves it, that when people are coming from war-torn places and grown up around conflict and violence, obviously you want to rescue them from that, but it also increases the likelihood that they'll be involved in conflict and violence. I don't think there's any evidence well, of that. Well, I think there's Tucker. quite a bit of that. Well, I haven't seen it. I haven't the, seen that evidence. People who grow up in places, and I'm not attacking them at all, I'm right. just saying it makes a kind of sense, and I think MS-13, and there are many other examples of this, certainly throughout the world where refugees have been resettled, that that's a potential cost. Would you acknowledge that? What I would say is that what we know and is fact is that communities with higher immigrant populations, including the, the populations you're talking about, actually have lower crime rates than communities. That so don't. you're saying if we so were to import, so there's a lower crime rate among the immigrant population in the United States than there is among the non-immigrant, the native-born population. Yeah. But doesn't it also make sense? And hard to kind of deny this that if you import people from peaceful, the people bring part of their culture with them. Sure. And if you bring people from very violent countries, they're more likely to commit violence Not if when they get here. That violence, right? If somebody is but, actually, but do you have evidence to show? That? I don't think that that's true, actually. Well, so have if you, you ever met any of the people we're talking about? Because sure. And I'm not attacking them. I'm just saying we're talking about large numbers of people. So we're right. speaking in the aggregate, exactly. and I have a lot of sympathy for people who want to get out of El Salvador, for sure, or Syria, right. for that matter. But I also think it's worth worrying about Americans to whom we owe an allegiance as fellow Americans and to sure. whom our government owns it, owes its only allegiance. Sure. And so like to say there's no cost, they're all great, that's a lie. I, and everyone I'm knows not that. saying that. I've never okay. said that all immigrants are great, right? I mean, I think immigrant, immigrants should be treated like any other citizen in our community. Well, why would they be treated like a But they're who, not who, citizens. If they commit a, well, all right, individual. I mean, I, I mean citizen as a person, so that was a mistake on my part. But they should be treated like anybody else in our country. If they commit crimes, they should be charged with those crimes, but right? why would you want to import any? I mean, we're doing this voluntarily, okay? Because we're doing a good deed. the immigrant population we're importing, but why would say, you want are not any criminals. Okay, but, but some of them actually are, and you know that to be true. I'm not saying most are. I think most are good people, and they want to be here for the right reasons, and I get it. But if you're importing people at your expense, and the U.S. government pays for this, as well, you know. We're not paying for asylum seekers to come to the United we're States. We're paying for the cost of burying them once they arrive, as you know. They don't and that really cost is, no, I'm not. They well, don't, they're not eligible for, for any benefit. Well, they go to benefits. public schools. And let me ask you about that. So we have resettled immigrants all over the country, but disproportionately to poor communities for a bunch of different reasons I know you're familiar with. Buffalo is one of them. Right. There's a piece today in the New York Post by Betsy McCoy. It's really interesting. Last decade, 10,000 refugees go to Buffalo. A lot of them wind up at Lafayette High School. 45 languages spoken there. 70% of the students are just learning English. Right. Now, this is one of the worst schools in the state of New York. 14% of people graduate on time. This is a massive burden for the school. It doesn't help the people who are already there. Right. The obvious question is, why aren't we resettling them in places where people support refugee resettlement, like Chevy Chase, Maryland, or Beverly Hills, California, because people don't want to bear the cost of the policies they support. Refugees are resettled in communities that do voluntarily accept them. The government does not force refugees in communities. So in general, as I said earlier, communities that receive refugees generally are asking for them, are benefiting from them, and are very happy to have them so there. So if you had a Utica, child, for example, oh, right? come on, if you had a child at a school that all of a sudden became half immigrant, non-English speaking. I don't care if every one of those kids is smart and disciplined and hardworking. That's a massive cost. You know what? I'm really glad you said that, Tucker, because my kids do go to a school like that. What percentage non-English speaking is that? I don't know, but there are a lot. They have several kids in their class. Well, then class, you know it's, and it's a fact, high cost to the school. It is. It, and it why is not acknowledge that? And the community, well, it is a cost to the school, but, right. but the community that I'm in and that my children go to school in is, is welcoming of those kids. They're happy to have it. Parents volunteer and work with them. Uh, the kids learn a lot from having this diverse cultures in their classes. And overall, I would say that it's a, it's a positive thing. Well, you, I'm not, you, and I'm I not would denying say it's a cost. The, both of us cost. live in one of the most affluent areas in the country. Here's my point, and this is, I guess, what bothers me. There's an unfairness for affluent people like us to turn to the rest of the country and say, you're bigots for not supporting the resettlement of people who don't speak our language, don't share our culture, and whose costs we will pay for, you're a bad person if you're not for that. I don't and that's think an I've unfair... ever called anybody a bigot. But isn't the position on Trump's executive orders that anyone who's for this is motivated by bigotry or dislike of the other? And that's not a fair thing to say. Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, receiving refugees and welcoming refugees in what I believe is an American tradition is something that I'm very proud of as an American. Right. It's something that I don't like to see okay. turn this back on. And that's, I mean, that's my point, really. Well, let me right? ask you one last question then, and, it, and it's about 
assimilation. Mm -hmm. So these, some of these are people who you know, already share our values and are familiar with our country, but many of them are not. And they're coming from places whose values are not just different from ours, but opposed to ours. They don't believe in an open liberal society. And I've got a lot of data to back it up, okay? okay. What are we doing when we import someone from a country where 98% of the women have experienced genital mutilation, for example, right. and people don't believe that men and women are equal, they hate gays, what are we doing to bring them in to our culture and to convince them that our values are the right values? I don't see that we're doing much. Actually, I think we are. I think that's one of the great things about America. I think that you will see that it takes a, one generation or less but, for people to really become assimilated. And in fact, uh, studies are showing that current recent immigrants are actually assimilating much quicker than they did in the so past. So what percentage? They learn English. They have American friends. They adopt American you know, social norms and, and cultural uh, experiences. So what, what percentage of immigrant families from, say, Somalia, where there's a 98% occurrence right. of female genital mutilation, practice that on their daughters in the United States? I have no idea. Are, do you I think no it would idea. be interesting to know? Uh, sure. And maybe there's a study out there that says it, but I don't know what it is, right? But, but, but my experience has been that when I speak to Somali young women who have immigrated to this country or, who, um, or whose parents have immigrated to this country, they are very American to me. But do you tell them that that's wrong? Well, I haven't had that conversation with well, very but, many of them, but, but, but many why I not? Have. I have had that conversation with some of them. Look, we worked on, uh, I was at the Board of Immigration Appeals yep. at the Department of Justice at the time when um, the famous FGM case right. came up. I remember. And a lot of people were arguing that FGM is, is, uh, is not a practice that is acceptable, especially by force, right? Well, it's illegal, so, among other things, but it still continues, and I just, I just wish we would take a stand. I don't know what the values. rates are in the U.S. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. All right, thanks, thanks a lot for joining us, Michelle. You're very welcome.